Aloha and welcome to the Peace Project. I am so glad to be able to talk to a man who inspires me so much, Kabir Sagal, an amazing author. I mean, to be able to say that you've written so many books, 12 books, but on top of that, to have them be best-selling books, my gosh. Uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, best-selling author. Also, to be able to get one Grammy is a huge accomplishment, but you've got five Grammys and three Latin Grammys. Um, you're a composer, a producer, and you do a lot to help many people. And your books have been inspiring. And you've had, I mean, there are some that really touch my heart. You worked with Deepak Chopra on that lovely piece. Oh my gosh, that one was so beautifully done. I mean, and it again spoke to the heart. It talked about how we all connect, you know, and I, I want to talk about that book. I would love to talk about your book on peace and how you became a part of that as well. And the book that you did with your father about your father. And I guess we'll start with that because I'd like to find out who you really are. I mean, if someone were to come to you and really ask you beyond the typical Wikipedia or the biography, which is a very long one you have, who would you say you really are? If you were really going to talk to someone and try to put into words your soul and your impressions of what your creative expression is, who are you, Kabir? It's a good question. I'm still I'm still trying to find out who I am. I guess that's why I'm um, I get at the most fundamental level. I try to be a creator, and uh, you know we're not here very long, so I want to make the most with what I've been blessed with to collaborate with um, gifted people and to put out projects that um, inspire folks. And, you know, sort of, I guess some of it is to, to leave a legacy that's, you know, we came through this place and made it a little better. Um, and so no matter what the medium, whether it's the music, the writing, the films, I try to take on projects that are, um, that will uplift and inspire and they may not be the most commercial project. Sometimes they work out to be, but anytime you can marry an art with a positive cause, I call it, I call it artivism. Um, that's where I like to be. And that's what makes me, um, really excites me. But you know what? I mean, you have a background that most people wouldn't imagine if they were going to see that you went to London School of Economics and Political Science, and you were involved in Wall Street, and you were involved in all that. And Typically, we do not think of people on Wall Street and people who are in economics as people who are trying to uplift and inspire. And I guess that's something I really am breaking down by knowing who you are, because you have been able to take your savvy. And I think some of this may have come from your father and, and then take that and use that to help other people in such a positive way. Do you, do you think some of that came from your father? I certainly think so. You know, I think when I was uh, just kind of getting out into the world uh, after college, I really wanted to um, just work in the arts, maybe do something in the creative creative world. But my father, others, he told me, you know, if you really want to help people go work at a bank. And I said, why? So, well, because you're going to learn how to make money and you're going to learn how to how the world functions um, from a commercial standpoint. And with those skills, you'll be able to kind of write your own ticket um, with what, what you want to do next. And so I sort of began this career in international banking. And then the credit crisis began in 2008. And I was, I don't want to say stuck, but I was at JP Morgan and I was just like learning about the world. And I was part of just hundreds of meetings about between government officials and uh, banking executives. And my job was to really um, was to learn about the world and, 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 and get paid for it and structure deals. And I learned and I traveled um, a lot. My focus was emerging markets. So it was in the Philippines, and Sri Lanka and all over. And so I think that at a very early age, I started to realize people are fundamentally the same. They want the same things. You know, it's they want a roof over their head. They want to take care of their family, but how you actually, how the world is inter interconnected. So if there is a shortage of 
uh, there's a fishing shortage in, off the coast in Malaysia. How does that affect prices of pasta in Italy? And how does that affect demand in, in the, the U.S.? So I started to see the links between international commerce. And then I think that I started to see the links between people and started to see the link between projects. And I think as a producer, which is what I do in my music profession, is try to see the links and how to make things happen. And when I see a project, I started to see the possibilities of who who should be on the project and how to engage with them. You know, I, I love travel and I have a travel show. And I really do believe that travel is one of the key elements of understanding people in the world. And one of the greatest gifts you can have when you travel is finding at the heart of the matter, we have a lot of similarities that we have some things, yes, that are differences, but that we have similarities that really can bridge the differences. And, and I would love to ask you what you learned. Obviously you mentioned some of those things you learned from travel, but you were, you're already young and you had to be a lot younger when you were traveling. Um, in, in the beginning, what was it like to be that young and actually trying to understand people? What did you learn from some of these travels? Um, exactly. Well, you know, I think when I was um, when I was banking, I was I was also kind of on the side writing a book about the history of money. I wrote this book called Coins: The Rich History of Money and How Is the Rich Life of Money and How Is History Has Shaped Us and I would travel to, for example, like Bangladesh, and I would meet with the banking officials there, but then I would spend the afternoon with an archaeologist going out to the hinterlands of, of Dhaka and looking at archaeological digs, looking for coins and talking about the, the Mauryan Empire. And and the reason I did that was because I was, I knew that one day I would leave JP Morgan, but I wanted to sort of um, write my own ticket out. And so I wrote this book and the travel was so important to it because I was able to see how people think about money in so many different currencies and, and, and countries. And finance is really just like music is one of these international currencies that is sort of everyone, you kind of have to know about money to, to function in this world. And so understanding the different cultural interpretations of what is money and how it's used and how people think about debt and savings, that was really informed by traveling to 25 different countries um, over the course of my time at JP Morgan to learn about, you know, to do my day job, but also to write this book on the history of money. And so my, from a young age, my father always exposed us. You're asking about my father. He, we would, we would travel with him. He ran a engineering company and had offices in a hundred countries in the world. And so we would travel with him at a very young age, um, and see him present to government officials and his, his employees. And so it was just a, you know, what, what country are we next? And I think that finding that commonality, like you said, it's travel is, is, is fatal to, um, to bigotry. Yes. Or, it, yes. You know, That's Mark of... Twain one, right? Yes. Hatred, yeah. Hatred, yeah. And I love that quote. My friend, Joseph Rosendo uses that at the end of each one of his shows um, because it is so, so true. And, and, and uh, now, you know, it's interesting because now we're not traveling as much. But then you've done this beautiful movie that's out on HBO called Fandango at the Wall, which again shows people exactly that same message you're talking about, about how when we understand the people, in this case in their music, how we break down the bigotry. And we, we totally see, again, the, the, the way we can communicate, especially through music, is such a healer in such a wonderful way. There's no differences. You may not speak Spanish but you can understand the language of the music, you know, and, and that is such a gift. You know, your father was a very wise man. And I guess at some point in the last what, two years, you wrote a book about your father and I've, I've written a few books and I know you learn so much with every book. What did you learn about your father that you, it's very hard to see your parents objectively most people I know have a very hard time seeing their parents objectively because they have all these other things that go on in their psychology and their psyche with their relationships. So what did you learn about your father in this book? You know, I, <clears throat> I wrote the book um, and it came out earlier this year and it's, it's called close the loop, which is really, it was the mantra growing up. It's like kind of drilled into me. 
he would always say to me, Kabir, did you close the loop on whatever the task was? Did you close the loop on making the, on, on making the plane reservation? Did you close the loop with that person? Did you close the loop on your homework? And it doesn't, close the loop doesn't just mean getting the job mean, getting the job done. It means notifying everyone who needs to know that the job is done. So everyone has a situational awareness that the job is done. So for example, if I finished, if I finished, um, I don't know, producing an album, I will then send an email out to everyone on the team saying, hey, the job is done. So everyone knows that it got done and people know it's not just guesswork. So he's always like kind of telling me to finish things. It's just finish, 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 finish. And if you keep on finishing things over your life, then it creates momentum that you will, I don't know, get addicted to finishing it, but also more projects will come your way because people know that you're a closer. And so that's kind of been, that's the philosophy in this book. Um, it's really a the close the loop is really the story of his life, but it all is also a few business lessons and closing loop is sort of the, the most important business lesson to your question about what I learned. Um, I got to tell you most of growing up, I grew up in Atlanta and most of my friends, they had stories about, you know, their parents going fishing or whatever, hanging out with them. My dad's stories were like an alphabet soup of like places from like the jungle book. I'd never heard of these places, Maharaja, Patiala and Punjab this and Gandhi. That it was like just, you know, it was India in, in the uh, pre-independence and post-independence in 1947. And I, I sort of picked it all up by osmosis, but I didn't actually have a good linear understanding of where my dad was in certain places in his life. So writing the book helped me place him in a chronology. And I was like, now I understand. And in doing that, I admire him even, even more. He left India when he was just a teenager with a few dollars in his pocket. And he ends up, um, you know, growing in, in a huge international corporation in America. And so it's really, it's truly the American dream story, um, which I'm very proud of and very proud of him. And, and being able to present this book so he can see it in his own hands he has been uh, just you know, ear to ear grins um, because he said, you know, I get to read all my eulogies. It's, it's nice. All his friends saying nice things on the back cover of the book. So it's really been a joy and a gift to be able to present that to him. You know what you did? You closed the loop. Exactly. Yeah. So. And, and so you did what he did. Now, how in the world did you get to have Andrew Young as your godfather? Well, he, um, he met my father back in the seventies. There was a, there was an ambassador to the United Nations named Ricky Jaipal. He was India's ambassador to the United Nations. And he was sort of seen as the dean of the diplomatic corps there in the 70s, one of the longest serving ambassadors there. So when Uncle Andy was in New York, um, um, Ricky Jaipal said to you, you know, there was this guy in Atlanta, you should meet him. And his name is Rugbeer Siegel, my, my father. So he connected um, my father to Andy Young. And, and then when Andy was leaving the mayorship of Atlanta, he didn't have a job to go to. He was looking, but he couldn't find a, a decent job. So my dad hired him to be the um, vice chairman of his company and at Law Engineering. And they worked together for several years traveling the world. And so I've known Andy since I was a little kid. And, and we would travel all over. We went to Zimbabwe together. We traveled. I mean, you, you name the place. We've been all over his families, his and uh, it was just an amazing experience to see uh, him articulate the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King and him thinking about how business and commerce can really be an agent of change. Wow. Um, and so that's, that's how that came about. And it's really been a, um, he wrote the afterword to this book uh, of, of uh, Close the Loop. And so really, really an honor to be in his presence all these years. You must have learned a lot from him. I did. I did. To have him as a godfather and a mentor. I mean, that's got to have been so mind expanding. I did. I actually wrote a book with him called Walk in My Shoes um, many, I think about 10 years ago now. And I've always, one of the most um, treasured gifts or, or photographs that I've taken recently is a photo with my father and Uncle Andy and having both of the books I've written with them in their hands, just to show them how much I, I love and value their guidance and um, what what impressive souls and powerful souls they've been in my life and in, 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 I think in contemporary history. 
Well, that ties me into asking the question, of course, about peace of Dr. Martin Luther King, one of the greatest, one of the greatest inspirations for peacemakers and peacekeepers. Um, did you ever get to hear any stories or uh, from him about um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Many, many, many. Um, yeah, I think one of the things Dr. King would uh, make people feel uncomfortable by preaching the funeral services, the eulogies to his contemporaries. He would, um, because they were so close to, to the prospect of death during the movement that Dr. King would, you know, kind of pretend like he was giving the funeral service of Andy Young or the funeral service of John Lewis or whatever, wherever these people were. In some ways, the laughter kind of helped put them at ease. And I think that was something, that is kind of one story that came to my head, but one thing that came to my mind is just how, the other thing I would say is the drama of the movement. And Andy would always say that we kind of produced parts of it, meaning that when they did the March on Selma, they did it around the time of the evening news so that it could be broadcast on the evening news. And I started to realize that Dr. King was a conceptualist, you know, he was a tactician, he had also was a producer, you know, and there's nothing, nothing that came to mind. He's a producer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing phony about that. I'm just saying that he, he knew how to um, create something, create the soul for us to magnify an issue into our consciousness. So, you know, I think it, it was, you know, it was on the evening news and the, and the, the, the there was a movie called justice in Nuremberg about the Nuremberg trials that was happening on the television. And then after that, the evening news would come on and they would have these hosings of what's going down in, in, um, in the American South. And so that juxtaposition of what happened in Nazi Germany with what's happening in, in Alabama was jarring for the American public. So I learned, you know, drama is so very important to telling a story, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a film or, or, or a book or, or creating a social movement. So, have you thought of doing a documentary on Uncle Andy? <laughs> what an interesting perspective you could have on his life, right? That would be a good one. Absolutely. He's, he's actually become a great uh, filmmaker and he's made so many films on different parts of the movement and contemporary issues. And he's a, um, his, his films are on like local television here in Georgia, but they also get air nationally. So he's a great filmmaker. And, but I think there does need to be a sort of comprehensive look at him in the movement. There was a good one recently called good trouble on, uh, on John Lewis, but Andy was often behind the scenes. You know, when I was trying to find pictures for my book with him, walking my shoes, I said, do you have the, the publisher wants some photos of you and Dr. King? He said, I was trying to get out of the shots. I was, I wasn't trying to be in the photographs or there weren't that many, but, um, but I realized, here's the one thing I should say, um, the thing I learned the most from Uncle Andy, and I think it's really important that you can get anything done that you want in your life, as long as you're ready to, to give other people credit for it. Meaning that if you're not hung up in the credit, then you really can change the world because an idea is, is I mean, so that's happened so many times in my life. Like, you know, you have an idea and like, let, let other people run with it. If, if it matters to you that much, go for it. As long as it's the change you want at the positive direction. So Andy's been, in, Andy has had his fingerprints on so much of American history and many people don't know his name. Um, and that's, I think that's a beautiful thing that they don't even know. And, and we're living in, in much of the world that he grabbed in. Well, that closes the loop on how you became such a great producer because you produced so many amazing Grammy award-winning pieces. I mean, was there also the tie when you worked with Deepak Chopra, the fact that he also was from India and, and understanding his journey also, that if we had had the closed door policy that people like your father and, and the Deepak Chopra wouldn't have had the opportunity to do what we've gained so much from, you wouldn't have had the opportunity. You know, so many people have learned. Um, and, and, and that must have been an interesting process to work with Deepak. It certainly was. And, you know, I met um, him much through just the Indian, I think I was on his radio show or something for one of my books. And then we just sort of struck up a relationship. And um, I think right around the time that um, 
I think it was 2017, a new administration was coming in. There was a tenor, sort of a populist tenor of anti-immigration. And we decided to, um, to embark on this project called Home, where everyone is welcome. And we created a, a book of poetry inspired by American immigrants and um, set it to New Age music that was largely made by Paul Abdurinos. And he's a great, great mu uh, musician and artist. And so that project um, was different because Deepak had done other music pro music projects before, but he hadn't done, he wasn't involved as much in the creation of the music. He was, you know, we had Deepak playing the hand percussion and different and singing. And so that was kind of eye opening. And, and we did group meditations all over the country. And I think there was a, um, among the people who experienced a project, there was a real understanding that, you know, you can protest in your mind too, you know, you, but it's a reflection of the world. And so if the, if the, the government policies are not to your liking, if the news isn't what you're liking, you have the option of saying, will it affect you? And you can kind of hopefully meditate and, and detach yourself from the illusion that you see outside because it's, it's just happening between our ears. Right. So I really learned from him about the power of meditation. Now I meditate every day as, as a result of our training. I've been meditating every day of my life since I've been 13. And wow. it, is, it is the way you get exactly what's inside there brings that inspiration forth for me. And I always write after I meditate, but Deepak is such a wonderful teacher. And on that piece, he, he spoke beautifully. And uh, some of the best production Paul's done, I think on that beautiful work. And again, you allowing that to happen as a producer and, and through all the pieces you've done, was so, so wonderful to see. I, I I don't know how you were able to do so many books and we haven't even mentioned, you've done children books, really inspiring children books. Where did that come from? Yeah, that um, that happened because my mother, she's a, um, a terrific educator. She was a university professor. She always wanted to write children's books. In fact, her mother, my grandmother was always, you know, one day I hope you write children's books. And it was always kind of this, dream she tucked away. Um, and, and then my mom and I were speaking, I said, you know, I'd written a couple of books by then. And I said, mom, if you really want to do this, we should, we should just do it. And so we started thinking about stories and what we could write about. And it became pretty clear that there was very few books for, um, about India for, I guess, the Western audience or the Indian diaspora. Because not if you're an Indian like me or Indian American, you don't have the same aesthetic or sensibility as someone, someone living in India. So we started writing these books like A Bucket of Blessings or Festival of Colors, which is about the Indian holiday of Holi. And they started to do really well. And it, it became sort of this niche. And now we've written, I think, eight children's books on life in India. And there's a whole ecosystem or I guess audience of Indian Americans in uh, America and this diaspora that they're like, hey, we, we're raising our kids, is reading your books. Oh. And it's gone beyond that because I think anyone, um, a lot of people realize that I think it's diverse, it's important to have diversity in children's literature. And this, the sooner you meet people from different walk of life or you're introduced to people from different walk of life prepares you for the world and the people you'll meet. So I think this whole movement of diversity in, in children's literature is something that that wasn't really what we were trying to tap into. We just wanted to write good stories, but I think now sort of the wind is at our back because we've, we've done so many of them. And so a pride in more. culture must have been developed as well. And it must have been wonderful for parents to be able to share their own stories as they were reading the books to their children about their own reflections on that. That I mean, it's a beautiful way to be able to have some self-worth to understanding how deep that culture is and the Indian culture goes so so deep you know so deep you know you think seven generations back of you up there think of where your seven generations back might have been right that and now you can think seven generations forward and when you're not here the legacy of that is so beautiful things that can happen from the seeds you've planted um and I do want to bring up the peace book I, I'd like to hear a little bit about this because peace is so important. And you now understand, of course, the importance for your connection with Uncle Andy and the UN um, and, and your work. I mean, when, how did you develop the, the book on peace? Well, I think um, it's called Legion of Peace. And um, I had met um, Mom and Eunice, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. 
he was a banker that won the Nobel Prize. And it was like, wow, a banker, that's not usually what you think about a humanitarian. But he he created a bank of called Grameen Bank that gave small loans to uh, predominantly women in Bangladesh and helped to lift people out, arguably out of poverty. And so uh, he had written the forward to my book on the history of money and a conversation with him and his daughter, Monica. We thought we would um, create a project called Legion of Peace. What does that mean? Well, all these, all these superhero movies and um, comic books, we thought, well, why don't we talk about the people who've won the Nobel Peace Prize as superheroes? And so we, we wrote a, a short little book and it profiles the Nobel Peace Laureates and we talk about their superpowers and which is love, empathy, reconciliation, kindness. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, bounding tall buildings or flying around the moon, but uh, these are things that make our world a better place. And, and so the, there are vignettes about, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, who was Nobel Peace Prize winner. There, there are vignettes about, um, you know, Dr. King, people who have, have, as we were speaking earlier, who have been so important, Archbishop Des Desmond Tutu. And so and then we paired it with music um, and with Lori Enriquez. Lori Enriquez is a great um, art, a children's artist. And we had uh, her play with um, Joey Alexander, who's a child prodigy piano player on the, on the record. So it was Legion of Peace by Lori Enriquez Quintet featuring Joey Alexander and Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner. So the album I thought was really, really a, an amazing project um, because her songwriting is just, I mean, there's a song called Brave as a Girl. And um, it's just, it's one of those songs that sort of stays in your head, but that was the project. And we were really excited about it. Legion of Peace and a book and an album. It's truly amazing. And I'm one last question because you involved me and it was a very interesting project you've been doing with people. Um, how they wear a couple of different hats. And you obviously wear many different hats. I don't know where you keep all those hats. If you have a closet somewhere, that wears your director, your, your producer hat. Yeah, <laughs> that hat. You got, you got lots of hats you wear. You wear, you know, you're a, a New York Times bestselling author. You know, you're a Grammy winning, five time Grammy award winning producer, you know, musician, all of this. So, so, you asked me, how do you do this? How do you wear your different hats? So I have to ask you back, how do you um, do this? What's your typical day like to be able to get these things accomplished? Yeah, I write this uh, newsletter, Portfolio Career, um, Cindy. And, and the reason I did this, I, I wrote this article for the Harvard Business Review. I literally wrote it like within 30 minutes. And I just, because it, it was just like a reflection of how I see the world. And I sent it to them and I had written a couple of pieces for them and they publish it. And it was like one of the best selling, I'm sorry, best viewed, um, highest traffic articles of their, of the year for the year was published. And every, every time they, they, re, they, they like to post it in, on social media. So I can always tell because I get this wave of like literally hundreds of people reaching out to me on social media saying, I just saw your article. And, uh, I think I kind of hit a nerve because they're, there are a lot of people who like do wear multiple hats and oftentimes there's a stigma to it. I know when I worked at an investment bank, I would be very hesitant to tell, I learned don't talk about your music activities because your manager may not think you're taking your job seriously. Your, your colleagues may think you're, um, they may be jealous of you, but I always told my clients because my clients wanted to work with someone who was interesting. So, and I didn't depend on them as much. So I became very sort of cagey uh, to be honest about what I did and how I did it. Um, and so that's just, that's just what I did. And so in terms of wearing hats, I, I tend to be, it's only recently that I sort of share everything with everyone because it's hard to you know hide on the world of social media, but for a long period of time, I would write my books in silence. No one at the bank would know I would serve on the weekends. People didn't know I was in the military reserve. And so the other thing I would say is being in the military, um, I've learned, there's sort of a need to know basis. Not everyone needs to know everything. People mostly need to know what they need to know about to get the job done. So I don't need to tell everyone the whole thing. I just tell people a slice to help them focus on that piece of information. So that's kind of something tactically that I've learned is just focus on the small nugget uh, in a conversation with people. Because if you start telling about everything you do, then it's like, oh, they may doubt you or how does he do it? Or there's, some, I don't know, there's all kinds of 
conniptions people can have. So I've just learned to keep it simple, do one thing at a time with people and keep moving the ball forward. What's your average day like in your schedule? I'm sorry. So my average, my days are very different. Um, so I think I wake up, I actually get a lot of sleep. I'll wake up at like eight um, o'clock in the morning. First thing I'll do is check email, of course. <laughs> then I, I'll work out for like 30 minutes. And then I um, look at the day's events. I, a lot of my operators on, I'll spend probably three hours working on creative projects, like to do my creative projects in the morning, whether that's working on writing a book right now, I'll try to write a few uh, aspects. And then I'll, and then in the afternoons, I save that for music making. And that's me checking with the artists I'm working with, sitting in front of my studio. And then I'm hosting my own show, the quarantine series in the evenings. And, um, and then I, I mean, I go to bed kind of late. It's amazing, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. I go to bed kind of late, like two, probably two o'clock every night. So I like to be up late because um, it's just quiet and I can think. So I don't really have a set schedule, but I do have this. I do have an app that I try to do like 10 things a day to keep it, like make it a good day. One is like take my vitamins. One is meditate. One is practice my Spanish. Another one is uh, on Duolingo because I'm trying to learn that more. Another one is pra practice guitar for 30 minutes um, and a few other ones. So I do have kind of a rigor around trying to develop positive habits. And it's pretty amazing when you do one thing so often, it compounds into a life skill. So, What do you enjoy doing most? Creating music. I love it. I love it. I love working with people to figure out how we... Um, make beautiful things together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you amaze me, Kabir. I mean, there's so much, so much there. I started out asking, who are you? And um, it's, I guess, a very difficult question to answer because you have many dimensions to who you are. And, and, and it's beautiful. I mean, you are, you're truly an inspired um, soul that's here to do a lot of good. And um, there's, so much, there's so much you have done and there's so much more you are going to be doing. I mean, many people would be more than happy just to have accomplished what you've accomplished in uh, a lifetime. And to think there's still so much more, I, I have to say it's very, very inspiring. And I, I, I thank you deeply for taking the time and your very, very busy schedule to let us learn about who you are and uh, be inspired by who you are. And, and I'm so very grateful for that. So many blessings to you on how you share these gifts um, with peace, with love, with understanding, and with wisdom. So thank you. Thank Mahalo. you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Aloha. Aloha. Big blessings to you always. <laughs>